I am Ben Doc Askins, the psychedelic science war storyteller, and this is the Anti Hero's Journey podcast. What's up, all you anti heroes out there? Doc Askins here, bringing you another Q5 episode of the podcast where I ask five of my favorite preparatory questions for ketamine assisted psychotherapy intention setting. My guest today is Captain Kimberly Juraveski. She is a disabled United States Air Force veteran and nurse practitioner. She was injured on active duty and developed complex regional pain syndrome secondary to her injuries. She received treatment with ketamine infusions and it saved her life. Since then, she has started a nonprofit organization called the Ketamine Task Force in order to improve patient access to ketamine therapies. Kimberly and the task force also realize that some people are suffering right now and can't wait for insurance policy changes. So Kimberly and her husband run retreats for veterans and first responders at little or no cost through the new Healing Our Heroes Foundation. She is also the author of two books, Ketamine Infusions, A Patient's Guide, and Ketamine Journeys, which is a journal for integration therapy, both of which are available on Amazon. Dot com. Kimberly, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. I really appreciate you having me. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So let's get rolling with question one. What is your story? So my story is not your typical um, join the Air Force at the age of 18, just got out of high school story. Um, I actually lived a full life before I joined the Air Force at the age of 37. I like to say it was my midlife crisis. Um, so basically, yes, I was in a midlife crisis and I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. We had actually moved quite a bit. Um, we're kind of unhappy with the state of the world and the way people around us were just about things and things. And when my kindergarten daughter came home from school saying her dress wasn't fancy enough because it didn't have a designer label, I was like, we're out of here. <laughs> so we, um, we actually moved to Israel for two years, and while we were in Israel, we almost got blown up on a bus. So, yeah, it was really crazy. Um, basically, we had our son with us who was a month old, and we were actually going to see friends of ours who had also moved to Israel around the same time. And um, it was crazy crowded on the bus, and we were going from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, packed in like sardines and of course they see a lady with a baby so that everyone pushes me to the back to the only two open seats there were one for me and one for my son in his car seat and they're pushing us to the back pushing us so we go all the way to the back sit in the last two you know how the, the row on those buses is a is a one big long row as opposed to the rest of the seats are like two seats so we sit there's one seat on the end and then there's two open seats so i put my son on the second to last seat there's a man sitting here and i'm sitting on the third seat and bus pulls out. And as the bus pulls out, I notice this guy is behaving very strangely. Sweat starts pouring down his face and he keeps reaching towards his chest as though he wants to like set off a bomb. And he keeps looking at me and he looks at my son and then he all of a sudden pulls out this prayer book. And he starts praying and praying and praying an Arab prayer book. Um, and he's looking around, looking at me, trying to touch his chest, looking at my son. And at this point, I'm like freaking out. But I'm like, I, if I say anything, if I move wrong, that's it. We're all goners. So I keep pointing to my son. I'm like, look at the baby. He's a baby. Don't hurt him. Don't hurt him. And he keeps looking at me and looking at my son. And of course, we're stuck in traffic. And so with a normal like trip to Tel Aviv is taking twice as long. I'm freaking out. The guy is like, sweat just keeps pouring down his head. Finally, finally, we pull into the bus station. As soon as we pull in, the guy looks at me and my son one last time, literally jumps over us, jumps over everybody, gets the hell out of there and is gone. I'm like, by the time I get to the front to tell the security team what happened, they're like, they run after they try to find him. They can't find him. But they come back and they're like, yeah, this guy was going to blow up the bus. Your son probably saved the whole bus. So oh my that God. was that was crazy. It was really insane. And it, but it just made me value the military so much more because I realized like how military protects us. Like I never thought about it really so much before living in Israel. 
like on a daily basis, you just see them. You see the soldiers with their guns. You see them walking around protecting you. And I always kind of felt a pull to join the military, but I, I just, no one in my family was uh, in the military. Like it wasn't, you know, being a religious Jew, it wasn't anything. I didn't know anyone who was in the military. So even though I kind of felt that pull, it was, wasn't something I ever did. But when we got back to the States after living in Israel for two years, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I kept interviewing for jobs and nothing made me happy. And I finally, I happened to see an advertisement online that said United States Air Force nurse midwives wanted. And I'm like, what? There's midwives in the military? Who knew? <laughs> so I called a recruiter and I start talking to him and he's like, and I'm like, I'm 37. Can I join? He's like, as a nurse midwife, as a nurse, as a doctor, and as a lawyer, they'll accept you to much older. He's like, absolutely. So he's like, we want you. You're doing this. And I'm like, well, what do you mean I'm doing this? He's like, you're doing this. So I went to my husband. I'm like, well, what do you think? And he loved the idea. And then I went to my parents and they loved the idea. And we went to his parents and they all loved the idea. So at the age of 37, I joined the United States Air Force. <laughs> That's it was really crazy. Um, now commission. So of course my recruiter says to me, I'm like, well, well, I never ran. I never did push-ups, sit-ups. Like, how am I going to be in the military? He's like, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Thank God I did not listen to him. <laughs> I actually went and trained with um, this guy who had been in the Marine Corps and was now a police officer and opened an exercise place, like literally two minutes from my house where we were living. And him and his whole team, I told them I was getting ready to go in the military. They completely trained me. I thank God every day for them because I would not have made it through commissioned officer training without them. As it was, I barely made it through. <laughs> that was like intense, very intense. Like I did not expect that. Um, amazing experience, but extremely intense. So then I got in, loved every minute of it. Now people ask me, how did you love every minute of it? Like here you came from the civilian world. I'm like, yeah, from the civilian world, you go to work, you see your patients, you do the same exact job every single day of the week. Now I love what I did. I love seeing patients, love doing babies. But in the military, you go to work and today you're seeing patients, but tomorrow there's an event happening. The next day you're helping to plan the Air Force ball. The day after that, there's a training exercise where you're giving out M&Ms to everyone for pretend medicine. It was so fun. I absolutely loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, unfortunately, after five years in the military, um, I got injured. I was in the bucket to be de deployed to Kuwait. And... Um, we did all kinds of training exercises because being in the bucket, obviously you're training to make sure you're ready to go overseas. And um, we had a training exercise where they called us in at two in the morning and they tell us there's been a nuclear attack on base and you have to go and rescue the patients. So what they do is in, the, in these medical situations, they actually dress people up and they're really pretend injured and you have to actually go rescue them. So they put us on a school bus and they ship us out to a field where it's pitch pitch black dark, not a light anywhere because it's a farm field in the middle of nowhere. And we're running around with flashlights. And somehow or other, while I was rescuing somebody, I went flying. I tripped over something or other who even knows to this day and injured my arm and ended up needing surgery from the injury. And when I woke up from the surgery, my arm kept swelling like a balloon. It like just swelled and swelled. It was insane. It turned bright red. And I woke up with not the normal surgical pain, but I literally felt like somebody had taken a match and lit my skin on fire. And I'm like, what in God's name is going on here? So I went back to the hand surgeon and he's like, I've never seen anything like this. I don't know what it is. Go to your doctor, primary care and tell me you need to go see a neurologist. Well, at that time in the military, there was a lot of budget cuts. And I guess the primary care docs were told not to send people to specialists because they were trying to cut back and save money. And um, so I kept begging my doctor to go see a neurologist. And he's like, oh no, you just need physical therapy. Because physical therapy is right on, on base. You know, that doesn't cost anything extra. So for months and months, this is going on. I'm begging him, please, please. You know, the hand surgeon said, I need to go see a neurologist. He's like, no, I really, I consulted with my superior. He really thinks you just need more physical therapy. After 10 months of physical therapy, he finally decides, okay, it's time to let you go see a neurologist now. So I went to see the neurologist and he's like, you have complex regional pain syndrome, which is a nerve disorder of some kind. They don't understand exactly what it is. They just know it's um, some kind of miscommunication between the brain and the nerves where you've been injured. So your brain still thinks you're injured, but it thinks you're injured much worse than you are. 
So it's, you know, it unfortunately, and then once you have it, it can spread anywhere else in the body. Um, so a few months after I got into neurologist, I actually had a secondary accident on black ice. And literally within minutes, my leg was like a balloon. The burning set in. It was crazy. I thought I broke it. Thankfully, it wasn't broken, but it didn't matter at that point. The CRPS attacked it within minutes of getting injured. So at that point, the Air Force says to me, well, you can't do pap smears. You can't deliver babies. You can't stand. You can't use your arm. I think we're retiring you. <laughs> so I ended up getting retirement, which was very lucky very lucky, but I also became extremely depressed. Um, I couldn't do my job. I couldn't leave my house because I couldn't put a sock on my foot. I couldn't put a shoe on. I was in so much pain. I was completely bedridden. My husband didn't know what to do with me. I literally wanted to end my life. Um, I was done. I was finished. And at that time, a friend of mine in Florida who happened to also have CRPS sent me a research article about this amazing new treatment for CRPS with ketamine that was being done in Germany. So I went down a rabbit hole, read everything I could get my hands on about this treatment. I was like, this is amazing. This is fantastic. Where can I get it done? Well, at that time in America, if you wanted to get it done, it was $20,000 and there was almost nobody doing it. And I wasn't working. My husband wasn't working. I was like, forget it. It's not happening. Um, but then several months after that, that same friend sent me a little thing from that um, clinicaltrials.gov site uh, showing that there was a research study going to be done at the hospital for special surgery with ketamine for CRPS. I immediately called them. They're like, great, we're putting you on the wait list. They call me back four months later and they're like, you still interested in the study? I'm like, 100%. So I went in, I had to do f all these different appointments to get evaluated and they finally called me back and said, yes, you qualified um, and we're going to admit you to the hospital in February. Um, you'll be in for five days and you'll either get ketamine or the placebo and see what happens from there. <clears throat> So I got admitted. Um, I did the five days. I knew immediately within hours that I was getting the real ketamine, not the fake stuff. Because um, ketamine's a trip, literally. And um, five days later, I got out of the hospital and I felt like a new person. I no longer want to kill myself. I no longer was extremely depressed. Um, my anxiety was better. I felt able to eat again. Um, I was able to put a shoe and sock on. Now, I want to clarify this because a lot of people ask me, was the pain gone? The pain was not gone but it was reduced by 50% enough that I could put a sock and shoe on. So it was unbelievable. And this was five days. So it was amazing. And then the research study continued for another six months, which was life-saving. But then I was like, well, what am I going to do next? Cause the research study is over. So I spoke to a friend of mine on Facebook who happened to be at the only VA in the United States that was starting to give ketamine for CRPS. And to this day, they're still one of the only VAs treating with ketamine for CRPS. Um, and I said to her, what do you think if we start a Facebook group so we could talk to other people getting this treatment and, you know, we could help others find this treatment. Um, so she said, that's a great idea. And we started a Facebook group, which now has over 12,000 members in it. Um, pretty evenly divided at this point between mental health patients and pain patients. And in the group, um, I was speaking to people and I did find treatment near me. Thankfully, I found a place to keep going after the study was over. But the biggest recurring theme and issue in our group, even to this day, is lack of access due to most places don't take insurance for this. Most insurance companies don't want to pay for ketamine because they say it's an off-label treatment. So at that point, um, a patient approached me and she said, you know, Kimberly, what can we do about this? And I approached some doctors and some uh, nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists, other people I was friendly with, and I said, we need to get together and start advocacy and try to figure out how we can overcome this problem of insurance for, um, companies not covering this. And that's what we are fighting for with the Ketamine Task Force. And that's basically my story. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful story, well told. And uh, segues also beautifully into question number two. Question number one being about the past and question number two being about where you're headed in the future. What are your intentions? So my intention now is to get ketamine covered by insurance companies for every single person out there so that no person is turned away from treatment. Um, the ketamine task force has been working really hard. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of barriers and hurdles. First, our first stop was the AMA, the American Medical Association. We tried to get them to um, put ketamine on label with a CPT code to pay for it. And they laughed at us and they're like, no. 
So then we went to Medicare and um, Medicare also turned us down. Unfortunately, we tried to get them to do a national coverage determination, had this beautiful application we worked on for about six months that we sent into them. And three weeks after we sent it in, they turned, they came back to us and said, no, we don't think there's enough research out there. We're like, well, we sent you 60 research articles. Did you read any of them? Well, this one article, blah, blah, blah. They went on and on and kept saying no. So we were like, okay, what is our next step? So we decided, we've been speaking with um, some people over at the FDA and they said, well, the big issue is that ketamine is not on label for major depression or chronic pain. So we're like, well, how do we get it on label? And they're like, well, we'll look at the research and we'll get back to you. So we have somebody who looks over the research and said to us, um, there's some huge holes in the research out there currently. Number one, there's been no long research studies. Number two, all the research studies out there are very small. And number three, hang on for me one second. My dog is knocking at the door. I'm just going to uh, ask my daughter to grab her. <laughs> That's totally okay. We can cut this in post. No, okay. no problem. Or, or I'll leave it in if I think it's funny. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. He's like, keeps knocking and knocking. <laughs> um, all right. So number three. Um, okay. So studies are short. Studies are small. And there's no set protocols. So all the studies are all over the place. So they said to us, if you can do a large, long study with a set protocol, we'd be willing to look at the evidence and then put ketamine on label first for major depression and then after for chronic pain. And the two things they said also is the both studies have to be completely separate and completely different. So we can't do one big study for major depression and complex regional pain syndrome and expect that to capture all. They have to be two completely different studies. Um, sorry, my daughter was just texting me back telling me she can't grab the dog because she's not here. <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> Anyways. No it's no problem at all. If the dog wants to be on the show, we let the dog on the show. We love, we love dogs. <laughs> She's an awesome dog, and usually I left the door open, but I guess my other daughter closed it. So um, I'm texting her now to, <laughs> to grab her. <laughs> anyway, so, um, okay, where was I? FDA approval. So we're working to do that. We're do working to do a large, long study. I have a wonderful group of 25 doctors, nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists who have been working for about four months to put together an amazing protocol. We're done with our protocol. We are ready to present to IRB. Um, we have seven community partner clinics around the state of Florida who are willing to administer the, stu the, the study infusions. And we're going to study veterans is what we decided because uh, that's the best way to get funding. Um, and I also think it's a great population to study because veterans are the ones that really need help. They're the ones very high risk for suicide. As we know, every day, unfortunately, we have veterans losing their lives to suicide, and that's something we're trying to fight. Um, so right now we're trying to find a research partner who's going to work with us and actually the primary investigator who's going to run the study. Um, that's our next step, and we're super excited about it, but it looks like it's definitely going to happen, so I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, that's very exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited. I just, It's been a lot. It's been a long time coming, but I think we're finally into the final steps to get that study going, and we have a lot of... Um, hope for where the money's going to come from for the study. So that's like looking, that's kind of going to depend on who our primary investigator is. Uh, but we actually have um, some exciting stuff with that happening as well. Yeah. A lot to be grateful for there, which is question number three. What are you grateful <laughs> for? So it's very interesting that I actually am grateful for complex regional pain syndrome and all it's brought me. Um, last summer, I had an amazing experience where I went with my daughter on a retreat for people who um, want to work in women's health in Mexico. Um, it I wasn't something I was sure I was going to be able to do um, because of my injury, because of my illness, being in a wheelchair. Um, a lot of the time, I not 100%, I do use a cane a little bit, but not as much as I used to be able to because unfortunately the cane injured my left arm. <laughs> So I do use the wheelchair quite a bit now. Um, so with the help of a friend and my husband and my daughter, I was able to do, because my daughter wants to be a, um, um, not a nurse midwife like I am, but an OBGYN. She wants to take after me, but she wants to go to the MD route. Um, so we went down to Mexico together and we did this amazing retreat where I got to do a sweat lodge. 
And during the sweat lodge, no medicine of any kind, just the, the heat, I had an amazing, amazing uh, visual journey where I met my spirit animal, um, Mother Wolf, who came to me and took me on this incredible journey where she took me to this big field that was filled with babies. And she said, these are all the babies you delivered as a midwife. And then she took me to another field filled with thousands of people. And she said, you haven't lost midwifery. These are all the souls and the people you are shepherding and helping. And you're still birthing. You're just birthing in a different way. And you're saving lives through your work now. And I came out of that and I felt so amazing because I'm like, I haven't lost my career. I haven't lost my ability to help people. I'm even doing it on a, a greater and larger scale than I was able to beforehand. You know, so even though I you know, lost my career as a nurse practitioner, even though I have still have bad days where I can't get out of bed, unfortunately, because um, like I like to say to people, ketamine is not a cure, it's a treatment. And it helps significantly. There's no question in my mind that ketamine saved my life. But I still have pain. I still do have bad days where I can't get off the, out of the bed or off the couch. But I'm still, I'm so grateful to all that ketamine and CRPS and complex regional pain syndrome has brought me in the military. Because it's made me like, I mean, I've gotten to meet people I never would have met. Get to talk to people like you. So I'm, I have to be grateful for, for all the trials and tribulations and even the pain. And, you know, even though I do have those bad days, thankfully I have not had any days where I want it in my life again. So I, I thank ketamine every day for that because it definitely saved my life. That's such an integrated perspective on so much pain and trial and tribulation turned into so much beauty and life and wholeness for so many people. I love it. So, yeah. M Mother Wolf, what are you creating <laughs> now? So, I realized, like you said in the beginning, that veterans, first responders, and medical professionals are losing their lives at a tremendous rate. Um, and they can't wait for a three-year resource study, you know? So I spoke to my partners at the Ketamine Task Force, and some of my doctors are very conservative that are on the board. And they're like, we really don't want to be involved in retreats. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. So I spoke to two of the other board members who said, I love the retreat idea, Kimberly, what can we do next? How can we help? So we decided to start a second organization called Healing Our Heroes Foundation um, to start doing retreats to bring veterans, first responders, and medical professionals out for healing now. Um, our eventual goal is to build a retreat center of our own in Florida because we want to make a first class. We want to have it integrated with the food. We want to have healing by working with plants and gardening. We want to bring horses and do some equine therapy. We want to have an amazing integrated program. And we want to be able to have it longer, too. We want to be able to have it for like five, six days even that people could come out for an extended little bit longer period of time really for deep healing because unfortunately, when we're using other people's retreat centers, which we're doing now, obviously it's a lot more expensive and we're trying to keep the costs as low as possible to people. Um, so we're actually going to be doing our very first retreat on the Big Island of Hawaii, which I'm super excited about. The people I'm working with have discounted it as much as they can. They brought the price down to $1,800 for us. And we still have two open spots if anyone out there listening wants to come. Um, it's actually going to be a few weeks from now, Labor Day weekend, and it's going to be an incredible experience. We're going to be on the Big Island at a beautiful retreat center, beautiful location up in the mountains. Uh, we're also going to do a couple day excursions in between getting sessions of ketamine. So we're going to be doing three, three sessions of ketamine total. Um, we're going to be eating all vegan, vegetarian, all natural food um, to cleanse the body as well as the mind. We're going to have yoga. We're going to have meditation. We're going to have some art therapy. We have an amazing facilitator that we're bringing with us from Florida. Um, we were lucky to raise enough money to bring her out, so I'm super excited about that. And we have an incredible team we're working with. I'm super excited. We have a psychiatric nurse practitioner, a certified nurse anesthetist who's going to be giving the medicine to us. And it just looks like it's going to be an absolutely amazing program. And we're going to end the program. We're going to open it with a traditional Hawaiian ceremony. And we're going to end it with a cacao ceremony. So I think it's really going to be incredible. That's some very exciting stuff. Are you planning on making this like a regular quarterly event, an annual event? Or is this kind of like the test case and we'll wait and see how it goes? 
it's kind of like the test case. Um, we're definitely going to do other retreats in other locations. Um, we hopefully are talking with some people in San Diego about possibly using a place out there. Um, and then we're going to be talking to some people in Florida about using their place until we can get our own off the ground. Um, and then we definitely want to go back to Hawaii at least once a year. Hopefully that's what we're hoping for. Um, and I'm very excited to see how it goes. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll be excited to watch and hear more about how all of that goes as well. Uh, I hope that we can keep in touch and see. Absolutely. And I do want to add one thing. what might hold there. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, a lot of people keep asking me, why medical professionals? Like, why are they lumped in with veterans and first responders? So I was a medical professional. People don't realize the trauma that goes along with being a medical professional. They don't realize what you see. To this day, I, I hate going into hospitals because of some of my drama from things that occurred and things I saw, like in the hospital, you know, like emergencies that happen. I mean, medical professionals see a lot. And especially after COVID, I think it was really brought home when there was quite a few suicides. And when you say medical professional, you're not just talking about doctors, I'm talking about nurses. I'm talking about EMTs, paramedics, flight nurses, um, even the guys that like, you know, work in the hospital, just like doing like, um, pulmonology, you know, pulmonology, um, respiratory Any, therapists. I mean, any anybody type of, in the room when the trauma anybody happens, in the room. right? Yeah. Yeah. Even people who housekeeping, you know, I wouldn't, you know, if they want to reach out to me and they've been in the hospital and seen stuff, reach out to me. We are happy to have you and take care of you, you know, cause there's a lot of trauma out there that people just don't realize is happening, you know, and it's, it's hard. It's, it's not easy being in the medical profession. And I definitely, you know, acknowledge that. And I want to thank every single person that works in that profession because it is not an easy one. Yeah. You're a beautiful person creating beautiful things. That's the short answer to question number four. So uh, I'm going to wrap things up with question number five. Who are you really? Who am I really? <laughs> I'm just me. I'm a veteran. Um, I love animals. That's like my first love. In fact, I'm actually very honored that right now I'm actually getting to do something called hippotherapy, which is physical therapy on the back of a horse. Um, I absolutely love it. It is the most painful thing because just imagine having it's already a, it's, a pain it's the disorder. Greek root for horse, right? Like I was thinking of actual hippopotamus, but uh, yes. you know, I'll settle for a horse. A hippopotamus therapy is a, a, a maybe we can design some kind of research protocol around that, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, so imagine already I'm in horrific pain and I'm putting myself through this torture, but I absolutely love horses. I love every minute of it. If I could do it twice a week, I would, even though like I'm in bed for a day afterwards, but that's okay. Cause, um, I love it. And it makes my, my, it makes my life worth living. Cause I absolutely love horses so much. I love every animal. I love dogs, I love horses, I love dolphins. I'm like an animal nut, but being able to do this hypotherapy has just like when I'm on my really bad days, when I'm feeling so down, I just think about my horse. His name is Gabe. <laughs> he's not mine. He's the place's horse, but I absolutely love him. We're like completely in sync with one another. When I get on his back, I give this big sigh and he gives this big sigh and it, it just makes me so happy. Um, so that's who I am. I'm just like an ordinary down to earth person who loves horses. Um, I also love to play Mahjong, which is a game. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Um, I play American Mahjong and um, I play it online. Uh, there's a site called realmahjong.com. It's super fun. I learned to play from my mom who learned to play from her mom. So it's been in the family and it's normally a game play with four people, but thanks to modern technology, you can now play it online and you can play with other people. So you can either play against the computer or you can play against with other people around the world. Um, and sometimes I'll have a friend who's actually up in New York who hops on and we'll play together. She's up there in New York and I'm in Florida and we're playing it together. So that's a lot of fun too. Um, Transgenerational interstate gaming. That sounds like some good stuff. Yeah. Any final great. thoughts? It's Nothing. Um, I mean, this has been amazing. I really thank you for reaching out and asking me to be on your podcast. And this has been super fun. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Like I was telling you at the outset, I got to listen to your uh, podcast episode on psychedelics today back in May of 2022 while I was running uh, around the outside of a camp over in Kosovo on a deployment with the National Guard and to just have the opportunity to to hear your story and then put it out there myself in person is just a, a privilege and an honor. So thank you for coming on the show. 
Absolutely. And if anyone wants to reach out to us at KenemyTaskForce.org, that's the easiest way you can reach out. Um, or HealingOurHeroesFlorida.org. Unfortunately, Healing Our Heroes Foundation was taken, so I had to do HealingOurHeroesFlorida.org. But either one, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, and or if you just want to connect, talk to me, talk more about Academy, and I'm happy to talk to anybody. Yeah, and we'll uh, throw a whole bunch of the details and links and everything into the show notes for this episode for anybody that wants to connect with you. Thank you again. Doc out. <laughs>